Hey, welcome to another episode of the Fit Growth Machine Podcast. I'm Brian Royce, your host. And today I have Zach Ligwak, and he's a partner at Savage Ventures, which has created $450 million in enterprise value and is on a path to creating $1 billion. That's awesome. But before talking to him, let me tell you that this episode is brought to you by BSR Digital. At BSR Digital, we help e-commerce brands that want to scale their business to the next level through Facebook, Instagram, and Google Ads. BSR Digital knows that most e-commerce brands want to grow their sales, but they lack a solid plan and professional team to help them succeed. That's why BSR Digital offers strategic plans, implementations, optimizations, and account audits to help more than a thousand e-commerce brands like yours grow their businesses, and surpass their competitors. To learn more, you can visit us at bsrdigital.com, and you can also email us at hello at bsrdigital.com. Now, as promised, I have Zach here with me. Hey, Zach, thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Brian. I'm excited to nerd out with you. Yeah, same thing, man. So why don't you start by telling the audience about your story? Yeah, I... I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, although I didn't, I don't know that I knew what that word meant when I was in middle school and high school, but I was always scheming, finding ways to make money, uh, even online as early as high school, you know, so this is like the late nineties, early two thousands era of the internet. I remember buying and selling guitars actually on eBay for, you know, a slight profit, um, and, and doing this, building a website, you know, really early on in the, in the computer age, but um, fast forward through college, I went to a music production. I studied music production at Middle Tennessee State University, started a company in school, a music production company with a partner, did m- the music business for six or seven years as an entrepreneur, as an investor, as um, a producer. And I ended up selling that company to my business partners and found my way into startups and technology. And then for the last six or seven years, I've been building what I would call like true digital marketing or growth hacking skills. and and um, doing it in a bunch of different industries. And about 2.5 years ago, I started a company called Savage Ventures with a friend of mine. And, and um, after, gosh, I would call it like 100 plus failures and, and one like moderate success, we're finally here, you know, on a, on a rocket ship, but it, it takes that many tries sometimes. Yeah, I was going to ask you that because I'm curious, you know, I, I think many people listening to these have read um, the uh poor dad or rich dad, poor dad book and the cash flow quadrants, you know, and everyone I think reading that book wants to be an investor or many people, at least me, right? And how do you end up there? Like, could you uh, explain a little bit more in detail? Like, how do you go from, hey, I want to create my own company to actually uh, be an investor for many other companies? Yeah, good question. Well, Savage Ventures, which is the company I started two and a half years ago, we call ourselves a venture operator and yes, we invest in and even acquire companies in some cases, which would be more akin to like uh, uh, private equity and not even venture capital. Uh, we, we actually operate these businesses too. So we'll purchase an asset and we'll actually create the goals, hire the people, execute the marketing experiments and try to s- scale the company. And so that's the main distinction. I don't think I could ever be a full-time passive investor I love being in the, especially the trenches of a business, but especially the marketing trenches of a business. And, uh, and yeah, so that's the main distinction between Savage Ventures and, and really any other investor that you'd come across. I haven't found many competitors of ours. Uh, there are some people that kind of do it, kind of do it the way we're doing it. And we haven't figured everything out, but we definitely have had, you know, a couple of success stories in the short term and, and um, have a really rich portfolio of digital media and direct consumer brands. It's awesome. So you not only invest in companies, but you actually operate them and help them grow. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So we're investing in and or acquiring businesses and then actually operating the business. So we at the Savage Ventures level, we've got, you know, we've got full-time employees for Savage Ventures and those people get shared across the portfolio, like you see at PE firms. And then we hire FTEs for each business. Um, most of the FTEs are on the um operational side of the business, the support side or content creation side, especially if we've got a a media company that's servicing a a particular niche, like we've got a music media company called American Songwriter. We've got uh, a group of healthcare brands under the 24-7 health umbrella. So obviously you need distinct knowledge 
um, uh, around healthcare and or music in those properties. So we've got FTEs for that purpose too. Exactly. Let's say I'm an entrepreneur. I own, let's say, I don't know, an e-commerce brand, and I want to know if I'm eligible to work with you guys and being acquired. How does that work? What do you guys do for me besides, of course, the money? And what 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 exactly or what areas of the business are you, let's say, hands-on? And what areas do I still need to be hands-on as the founder? Yeah, great question. The reason to partner with a company like Savage Ventures is because we've got all the infrastructure built out that you as the founder probably either shouldn't be building out or don't have the wherewithal to build out or don't even want to build out. Like, for example, back office stuff like HR, accounting. And then obviously you've, you're basically, if you partnered with us, you have a team of growth hackers that know how to market your products and run high tempo testing. Then you've got, you know, some, some uh, you've got the financial component. We've got CFOs that get deployed in these companies. And so you're basically, you are allowed to, to live up to your full potential as a founder, like do whatever you do best and, and stay kind of in your lane. Maybe you're a creative and you just like ideating and creating uh, products and you happen to have a couple products that took off and you don't really want to take them to the next level. You just want to keep ideating and creating. That's fine. You know, we can, we can figure out how to, how to scale them with you. That's great. And I know, you know, uh, people listening here to, to the interview, some of them are doing, I don't know, some of them are starting out, some of them are doing six figures, some of them are doing seven, and also some of them are doing eight figures, right? So I would like to cover with you, let's say, how to, I don't know, the, the fundamentals to scale from zero or one, let's say, million to 10 million, because I know there's a big gap and a lot of efforts to actually go from one to the other. So I would like to, for you to guide the audience on, I don't know, how to approach the strategy, how do, how, what's the, probably the necessary team for going from one stage to the other. And yeah, we can take it from there, I think. Yeah. If you're really young, especially if you're pre what I would call like product market fit and product market fit means a lot of different things in different industries, but with like a e-commerce brand and be like, you're at least doing, you know, five figures, if not six figures in revenue. Like there are people that are in the marketplace that clearly want to buy your product without a lot of, you know, paid marketing around it. Like it's kind of happening organically. Like that's product market fit. A lot of people spend way too much time creating a plan. I've in, even encountered plans over the years that are like 20 pages long, you know, with a pre-revenue company. And I'm like, what are you doing? Just build something and see if people want to buy it. And um, I would keep it super simple to start and, and stay very focused at start. So if you've got product market fit or even pre that, create like a one page plan. That's what we do at our companies that are sub $10 million in revenue is it's just a one page strategy doc. It's like, here's our quantitative goal, which would be like X revenue by X date. Here's our qualitative goal, which would be like become X for Y or something like that. So become like the top seller of um, this fitness app for this audience, or I'm just making something up. And then you've got your priorities and I would keep them under five with probably two to three to start on like what you think you need to work on, whether it's like a revenue stream or a particular channel, it could be like an influencer network, the two or three things that you know, you need to do that will most affect those qualitative and quantitative goals. And then we take those priorities and put them into what is called an OKR framework, objectives and key results. And you set quantitative key results against those priorities. So do X revenue by X date is the simplest form of a key result. And then you surround yourself with the people that will help you get there to the key results. And that's really a good starting place, like develop a simple strategy and develop simple key results against the, the quantitative and qualitative goals and just focus maniacally on those priorities and nothing else. Okay, great. Then, did he mention, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, something called like high tempo testing processes. So what's that about? Yeah, high tempo testing came out of Silicon Valley. Uh, the person that originally coined it, I think was, oh, I'm forgetting his name right now, but he wrote a book called Hacking Growth. Sean something, Sean Heisen or Sean, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your name in. I know uh, but, but yeah, the book's called Hacking Growth, and he was in—he was the growth lead at Dropbox and a couple of other early 
uh, I would call like unicorn companies that came out of Silicon Valley. And it's basically taking an approach that developers have used in Silicon Valley for many, many years. Um, and uh, what, what they call out in Silicon Valley like sprints. So they have weekly sprints and, and it's a really just fast paced environment where they're working on dev features and releasing dev features super quickly. And it's taking that approach and actually applying it to marketing and especially like digital technical marketing. Um, you can apply this to a bunch of other disciplines, but I found that marketing is one of the better disciplines to apply it to. And so once you have your key results, so you know you need to do, uh, you're gonna focus on this and you're gonna do, you're gonna try to do X revenue by X date through this channel or something like that. Then you can run what I call high tempo testing against that objective. So in my mind, especially if you're a pre $10 million company, you will win if you can run, assuming people want to buy your product, obviously there has to be product market fit, yeah. right? Assuming you have product market fit, you will win if you just run as many thoughtful experiments as possible every week against your objectives. Like you will get somewhere, whether that's 5 million, 10 million, 15 million, even a million starting out, I don't know. It's, there are other variables at play there, but it will give you a really good chance at success. And so imagine like a Trello board set up in what's called like Kanban style. Where in, in the far left, you've got all of your ideas that you think will help you reach those goals. I just, um, it could be like, let's try Facebook ads. That could be a goal. You need to, you need to be a little bit more rigorous as to like quantified and stuff like that. But one could be like, let's test Facebook ads out. One could be like, let's partner with these five influencers and try to build an influencer network out. Like those are examples of experiments. And then you, we, we actually quantifiably score them via the ICE methodology, which is impact, confidence, and ease. Impact is simple, like how much revenue will this drive or how much will affect the goal. Confidence is how confident you are. And when you're just starting out, a lot of that confidence is external. Like it could be like a company in our niche also did something similar to this. Like they developed a quiz funnel. So yep. it's likely a quiz funnel will work for us, at least to a certain extent. So our confidence is a little higher there. When you have a bunch of experiments under your belt, then you value internal confidence. Like we've ran this experiment, which informs the confidence of this experiment. And so the confidence is really important. And then you've got ease, which is when you're first starting out is, is really, really important. It's how much money does it cost and how much time is it gonna to take to pull off? So you take the average of those three scores and it's, it's a really easy way to um, prioritize your experiments. And then you just need to start executing as fast as possible, like executing those experiments like this. And you'll start to see some, you'll start to learn and, and know that when you're first starting out, like 90 plus percent of your experiments are gonna work. But like when you start to, learn and learn and learn, you almost like know something's going to work before you even launch it, which is a great place to be. That's when you're you usually see more of like an exponential curve in your business versus a, a linear one. Um, so yeah, that, that's what we do with our 10 million revenue companies. We keep it simple. We do OKRs and we do high tempo testing. And that's, that's our system for growing these companies. Great. I, re I really like what you said about the internal and external, you know, um, confidence because uh, some people actually, and you tell me, I mean, what you think about this, but many people want to reinvent the wheel, right? And create something new and be the first ones out there with something uh, innovative. And that's awesome, but it's not for everyone, right? And you have the resources, the timing and many other things, right? But when you don't reinvent the wheel and there are some other people that have started doing what you're trying to do now, before, you know, you can actually take a look at what works well for them and replicate that initial success mm -hmm. in your company and then take it from there. So I love to know your take on that. Like, do you typically take on companies that say, hey, I, I want to, you know, create something new that doesn't exist? Or are you more inclined to actually work with companies that is like, hey, I, I know this works here. I'm going to replicate part of or the total thing there and create something of my own. Yeah, this for Savage Ventures, we would certainly prioritize, well, we don't work with anything pre-product market fit. The founder just needs to figure that out. Like that's on the founder to figure out. And I think the founder will learn a lot of lessons. Whether they fail or succeed, they'll, they'll learn a lot. And I think they're better off for not partnering with us before that point. But once you have product market fit, we like to talk to companies and I say, I would say we prioritize vertical integration opportunities more so than horizontal, meaning we've got these, we've got a handful of healthcare assets with like a consumer audience. So we've got a large healthcare newsletter, 
for example, with a lot of like 35 to 55 year old um, females in America that are really into keto and health and wellness, like really deep, you know, like really serious health and wellness, like they're into yoga, Pilates, et cetera. And so like, if you developed a brand that where a lot of those people would, that where a lot of those people would want to buy it, like that, like that's more interesting to us, you know, at that point in time, mm -hmm. it makes sense too, because we could partner and then instantly make it a seven figure company probably just with this massive audience we've built. And then it, we would consider horizontal opportunities. They're just not as um, appealing just because we don't already have an audience. And I think e-commerce companies, this is kind of a tangent, but not really. Like I think e-commerce companies need to start thinking about how to build media around what they're doing. The days of running Facebook ads and um, just doing all your e-marketing through email is kind of gone. I mean, it's, it's just a lot harder and the companies that are going to thrive in this new environment, this new cookie-less environment that's going to be happening and this new privacy regulated environment that's going to happen, just like we've experienced in Europe over the past couple of years, going to happen in the United States. The companies that are going to thrive are the companies that are actually going to have an audience, not just a customer list. They, they have a, you're producing content that is valuable for a particular audience and you're generating engagement outside of your Clavio list, you know? So then that's what, that's what I, we've, we've kind of lucked into this because we do a lot of digital media companies and now we're starting to think about, um, well, we're realizing that that's really smart because a lot of these large companies, like for example, HubSpot purchased the hustle. It's like a they made a media acquisition and now they're starting a podcast network. So we're in a position now to partner with some brands that where we already have an audience built for them. Like that's awesome, but I think we're in a position to make a lot, a lot of value, create a lot of value for these larger brands if they were to come partner with us or acquire one of our media companies with millions and millions of people, you know, that engage with the content daily. So I think if you, if you are an e-commerce company, you're doing millions in revenue, and you don't quite have that media component built out, I think you need to prioritize it ASAP. By media, in this case. Do you refer to, I don't know, creating social media content, blog posts, uh, having a podcast, a community engaged on, I don't know, Facebook group, Slack or Discord or? Yeah, all other? of the all of the above is, is potential. Obviously, you need to think through like, where do, where's your audience? And, yeah. and if you already have um, opportunities, like if you, for example, if you've been prioritizing Instagram, if you're an e-commerce brand and you've got, you know, I don't know, 20, 30,000 followers there. And you kind of haphazardly walked into the 20, 30,000 followers, which I would imagine is ha having a, happening a lot where you're just kind of like inconsistently posting there, but people love your brand. And so they're just following the social handle. Maybe they're clicking on, you know, collab you email and going over to Instagram or whatever um, that I would just start there and prioritize one channel at a time. So I'd start, it could be uh, you start a newsletter. It could be you start a podcast. It could be you scale an Instagram channel, but just pick a channel based on what you already have and what, uh, where your audience lives and focus all your energy into that one channel. And then once you grow that channel, it's going to be much easier to go into other channels because you can use that channel to promote the other channels. What we yeah. do a lot is like, we'll grow, you know, a Facebook page and then we'll start posting YouTube videos to Facebook. And I know the algorithm doesn't love that, but if we've got 10 million followers on Facebook, it doesn't really matter. A bunch of people are going to see the post. And so they'll click over to YouTube and subscribe and yeah. you can just grow your channels like that, like kind of one at a time. And then there's a compounding effect and you've got like three or four big channels and you can, you know, cross promote the, the crap out of each other. And um, they all just kind of grow and you develop this media ecosystem that will help you when Facebook changes everything on you overnight, exactly. you know? Yeah. yeah, it is what we get for, you know, living in rented land, you know, when mm -hmm. rules change, we are there and we are impacted by, by those rules. So, uh, um, this is totally related to what we have been discussing in a few past uh, episodes, uh, and it's uh, zero party data. I know you are also an expert marketer, so I would love your take on that. You know, it's like, you know, for those listening that don't know what zero party data or first party data or third party data is, is like, the main difference is that zero party data is provided by the, the end user or your customers visitor subscribers, you ask them questions, it could be through a quiz survey or any other shape or form. But the point is that they provide you with the data, first party data, you know, is the, the one that, you know, you get 
through pixels and all stuff, you know, you, you can track, uh, I don't know, how many visitors, how many orders, how many of those, uh, and some aggregated informa information, age, gender, blah, blah, blah. And then third party data, you can, you can actually uh, buy it uh, I don't know, from any other, I don't know, any mm -hmm. platform or any other, I don't know, email list that you can buy online or partnering up with some external people to your company. So what's your take on first party data, zero party data and the, the future of that based on what you said? Well, it's going to become obviously more important and it definitely needs to be prioritized. If you, for the companies in your audience that are doing five plus million dollars in revenue, you probably already have a lot of first party data from all the sales you've done. And whether you prioritize experiments that collect first party data outside of your just normal ad to carters and, and purchasers, I'm not sure if you are like, for example, if, if you, for the larger companies in your audience, I would almost just prioritize building a larger audience because then you'll get more sales and you'll just collect more first party data uh, over time. Um, sorry if that's loud. One of our companies is celebrating something, which is awesome. Um, no people are yelling in the conference room, which is good. I want to go see what that is in a second. Um, the, uh, if you're a younger company though, and you don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of purchasers in the past, I would definitely start to prioritize collecting first party data and building an audience. Yeah, a quick, uh, some, you, you can give some sort of like a lead magnet is like the way it's been done for the most part over like the last 10 years where you create, you know, some piece of content. Like if I'm a keto company, I'll, I'll create like a keto eating guide or something and I'll go try to get emails for that. All that's fine. I would just figure out um, it, it probably it's a balance of both is what I'm trying to say. Like you need to start prioritizing first party data even more. And for those that have been neglecting their customer list or even add to cart list and any other, you know, first party data repository that they've built over the time of their company, I would certainly start to take a harder look at that and actually servicing, serving them probably more like content that provides value versus just serving them, you know, your, your quarterly sales sale that's happening. You know, so starting to think about like how to utilize your first party data more effectively, which will create more referrals long term and create more customer lifetime value and will help you in a cookie list uh, and uh, in a data list world almost, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting over the next couple of years to see it all evolve in the United States, but it's happening. So you need to prepare for it. Yeah. So we briefly discussed that it's important to create content for the audience, nurture them and be present for them adding value and not only, you know, doing uh, paid ads, which is fine, but you need that complement to actually uh, make a bigger impact in this good less world that we are heading into and uh, the privacy policies and all this stuff. But I feel that there's more to it, right? I mean, many companies are doing paid ads, not so many companies are creating their own content as they should, but even less companies are building affiliate programs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so affiliate is another channel that is top of mind right now, because if you can create an affiliate network, it's another way to create value and sales in this like privacy first cookieless world. In fact, I would start to it, it if you're a certain type of company, maybe you're a founder and you've got a couple million dollar e commerce company, but you don't really know how to create content, you just know how to create this awesome product. Partnering with an influencer might be actually a good approach for you. If you're a large company that's looking to diversify their channels, absolutely creating an influencer network makes a ton of sense. I There are three ways to approach influencers, I think. Just like hiring great employees, it's good to find some on the up and up. Like maybe they've got 40 or 50,000 followers on Instagram, but they're creating good content. You could see a lot of growth in their channel and it's perfect for your audience. I would probably start there because you can create richer relationships with them and kind of grow with them. I always think about like the uh, Barstool and High Noon thing that happened in like 2019, 2020, where Barstool was starting to explode. High Noon was, was from a timing standpoint, like perfect to market or the first RTD seltzer. We're one of the first RTD seltzers or probably other out, others out there. But uh, in, in the market's view, it was Barstool's brand, right? But it wasn't, Barstool was just marketing the brand. And maybe they had some equity or something, which is another great approach to finding these 
influencers that you think will be valuable long term is actually like developing some sort of rev share joint venture with them or or um, just getting them more bought in than here's 200 bucks for an Instagram post. I would certainly prioritize those things over $200 for an Instagram post. $200 for an Instagram post though, for a larger account might be the only way to get started, or maybe it's a thousand or 2000 bucks uh, for a larger influencer. And that's fine. And if it performs really well, then you can double down on that, or you could approach that person to develop more of a longstanding relationship. Like, Hey, here's, you know, two points, five points of our company. Like, it, assuming they really like the product. So long story short, I would prioritize for, if you're a younger company, prioritize the influencers that are perfect for your audience that are on the right channels and that are, you know, coming up. Like they're not, you know, they don't have 5 million followers on Instagram and, and are already represented by one of the top influencer managers. Um, and then developing, you know, more robust relationships with them versus the, the $200 for an Instagram post. And then after you figure that out, you can go to the more top tier influencers um, and probably be very choosy over, over who you pick and run some tests with them and then try to bring them in also in a more integrated way other than just paying them a thousand bucks for a post here and there. Yep. I mean, why creating everything from scratch if you can leverage somebody else's audience that could be yours too, right? Um, yeah, and you could leverage the influencer's audience to build your own audience too. You could do co-branded stuff with them, whether it's yeah. a, you know, a piece of content, maybe it's a series, maybe you launch a podcast together, whatever. Going back to what we were talking about earlier about how you know picking the channel that you you want to prioritize, you know, maybe influencer is part of how you grow your own channel. Yeah, and something else that we always do, probably this is a little bit too technical for the audience, but in a nutshell, basically consists in asking the influencer if they are okay with sharing their uh, Facebook, let's say Facebook pixel, right? Uh, with the, uh, your ad account and you you pay for the ad spend, let's say, you know, and you use links that will give them commission if people buy, you know, uh, with a new, any code, affiliate links or whatever, but basically through them doing that with you and with your company, I mean, sharing their Facebook pixel with you, you can actually leverage their audience. Even if the post comes from, from your company only, you can actually lever, leverage their audience. And then once the audience is in your pixel, then it's yours, right? So that's another way to leverage uh, the influencer's audience in a, in a transparent way that works for both of them, right? It's a win-win. So- um, Yeah, I would say, I would say that you don't necessarily need the pixel swap. That would be like icing on the cake, but we, we've ran, whenever we run Facebook ads these days, and except for a couple of other situations, it is like backed by an influencer. Like there's an influencer talking about how awesome our product is or something like that. Like those, that's basically our paid media budget. Yeah. It's like 90% to that and like 10% to remarketing or something across all of our brands that are doing substantial e-commerce revenue. That's awesome. And, uh, about affiliate programs, when do you think it's the right time, more or less, to start one? For instance, I don't know, if I'm starting out, I don't know, would affiliates want to promote me? Would they be interested because, I don't know, I have no traction whatsoever? Or when I'm doing, I don't know, X figures, what's your take on that? Yeah, you need product market fit, so you're just going to have to grind it out to see if the market actually wants your product. And then I think I mean, you could call DM influencers and if you've got a really compelling product and they, they're willing to try it, then send it to them, see if they like it. And a lot of them, if you truly have a great product, will love it and they'll be more willing to work with you. That's kind of how, the, that's sort of the evolution that I see happen a lot. That's it's awesome. like a, the influencer tries it before they buy it. That's awesome. So um, since I have you here, you know, not, not, not every day we have, you know, uh, an investor, uh, a potential partner, you know, for any commerce brand here on the show. So I think the audience would be interested in knowing when they, as the brand, are the right fit for you guys, you know, and what things do you, do you look at or do you value most when considering investing in a company or not? You mentioned a few things already, right? the product market fit and some other stuff, but is there anything else you mentioned, uh, you would like to mention, sorry, that they should take into consideration when approaching people like you or a company like yours? Yeah, one thing that your audience probably isn't thinking about is your cap table. 
So if you take, I know most companies have to raise some money to fuel growth early on and that's fine. Taking it from like a hundred individuals though is really complicated. Think about like how messy that is, um, especially when you're giving like 0.2% to people. Just try not to do that. Try to keep it as your cap table more streamlined and simple. I know in some cases you've got to take a small 25k check from this person and to get you know to give away a percent or something like that. And that's fine. Just do it as as least as possible. So that's helpful when the cap table is super clean. Like I love we love looking at deals that we can close in like 30 days because there's only the three founders and they've all bootstrapped it. So like staying scrappy is another thing, which is related to the cap table. Like that signals to us, like you're willing to figure shit out and you're willing to do whatever it takes to win. And um, I would say the third thing I've already mentioned it, but it's like vertical integration. So we've got healthcare, we've got a strong healthcare media conglomerate. We've got with a bunch of different products in it, we've same, same in music and then same in sports. So if you are, if you can fit one of those three verticals, I think it's more appealing than other verticals. We're also launching um, some finance stuff too. Uh, And so like, if we've built these audiences that would want to purchase your product, that's an easy one for us. Like we've got just to take the bar stool and like high noon analogy, we've got all these media codes like bar stool built out on these different verticals that, you know, we could instantly flip a switch and, you know, transform your P and L potentially. Um, and we already have influencer networks or we're building influencer networks in each of those verticals too. So we can just turn on all these revenue streams most likely through all these different channels. And then the other thing is, I mean, yes, product market fit has to be there. Um, if it is, so when I think the operating system for any business, it's like timing has to be there. Like if timing is not there, it's not going to ever scale exponentially. For example, I've done a lot of startups. Like I tried to do a DoorDash type of thing like six or seven years ago and it failed miserably. Was, if I started that thing in 2020, probably would have been a totally different story. Same product, same everything. Um, timing has to be there. An example is uh, in 2020, sports betting was starting to get legalized in a bunch of different states. And so we used some of our media codes that had a, a, an audience that we needed to market uh, through an affiliate model sports betting products for the operators or the sports books. And so that, that's, that's a, an example where timing is perfect. You know, that revenue stream took off as a result of governments, the government saying, okay, here you go. Uh, we approve this market. Essentially, we're creating this market for you. So looking at those pockets around government and like for timing is, is super interesting to us. And that's probably a situation where we'd actually partner with a company a little early on if the timing's right. Um, but, but to continue this, like, which is kind of a tangent, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place, but the, the growth op- or uh, an operating system consists of timing has to be there. It, you can't start DoorDash in 2010. You know, you can't do X, you can't do Uber in 2000, right? Or I, I always remember, I think it was like, um, what was that company that started in like 1999, 2000, like during the dot com crash? It was called like Webvan or something where it, it was like grocery delivery. Can you imagine grocery delivery in 2000? They raised like, I remember it was right near the dot com crash. They raised like, I don't know, 200 to $300 million and just burnt, burnt it super quickly. Timing just wasn't there, but that works now, right? It works in, in 2022. Timing has to be there. And when timing is there and you've you've likely got product market fit, you need three other things to make a company successful. You need good people, you need the right processes, and then you need the right technology. And so with pe- people's kind of self-explanatory, like you need to find people that align with your values and that are really bought into what you're trying to do and that work hard and, and they're you know, there's, there's, you define your own values, but it's people that match your values and that have the right expertise to pull it off and the right scrappiness. Then with process, it's the things I mentioned earlier. It's how do we do strategy? How do we do our goal setting? Which is, we, we do that with OKRs. How do we do our experimentation? Like you, you have these processes that you built up. How do you hire? You don't need to like develop a hiring process right away, but like you slowly develop these processes over time and you prioritize the ones that are core to your business early on. You probably only have like two processes to start. Like maybe it's high tempo testing and like OKRs, for example. And then technology doesn't necessarily mean you're actually creating technology. It, it means you're, you're leveraging technology to make things more efficient, 
whether that's leveraging Klaviyo, for example, to do all of your email and SMS automation in a really intelligent way, or maybe it's leveraging Facebook ads, like you put your leveraging technology to scale your company. And if those three things, if you're maximizing those three things, and then you have timing as another variable that is necessary, like you will be successful. That's great. I love all the value you have shared during, during the interview. I want to thank you for that. And to wrap up, I always like to ask uh, the guest in this case, you about, I don't know, your favorite books and mentors, if you have read or had any mentors to uh, mention. Yeah, when I get asked this question, I normally just say like the last three or four things I've read that you know were compelling and or that added value. But from a marketing standpoint, I think there are a couple staples from like a copywriting and brand positioning standpoint, I would read anything by Donald Miller, but definitely building a story brand okay. by Donald Miller. He actually lives here in Nashville. Uh, for uh, in the same vein, like any marketing, like a staple marketing book that every marketer needs to read is Influenced by Robert Cialdini. If you haven't read that, go read it right away. And then the third one I'd add is hacking growth. Like that would be a good primer for like how to market effectively in 2022. It's building a story brand, hacking growth by Sean Ellis, I think is his name. I was not, couldn't remember his name earlier. And then the third one would be influence, how to persuade people and influence things or something like that by Robert Cialdini. It's great. And to you guys listening, everything mentioned here will be in the show notes. So if you want to say, hey, I, I don't remember the, the, the name of the book he mentioned. Everything will be linked there, so you can go grab that there. Uh, if you're not there already and you are listening to this on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else, you can actually go to the fitgrowthmachine.com uh, and um, get that there. Uh, you've been great, Zach. Thanks a lot for your time. Uh, where can people go to learn more about you and the company Savage Ventures? Savage.ventures is the URL. Definitely go there. And if you're interested in partnering with us, there's a form on that page and you can click through to a couple of other pages to see some of those verticals that I talked about and see our portfolio and all that stuff. And then I'm not really on social media personally because I'm on it every day for our companies, but I do spend some time on LinkedIn. So if you want to reach out to me or connect with me, definitely go to LinkedIn and search Zach Litwack or Savage Ventures. That's awesome. Thank you again, Zach, for being on the show. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I hope this was valuable for your audience. I enjoyed the combo.